Welcome to Group Talk. Four shows, one podcast from the Small Group Network focusing on topics relevant to small group ministries. Whether you're in a church of 100 or 10,000, whether you're a volunteer or staff, we want to support, encourage, and equip you to lead well. So relax, listen, and enjoy Inside Saddleback with Steve Gladen. Happy New Year to all of you small group point people out there in the trenches of small group ministry. And thank you so much for tuning in to listen to this show today. Derek here along with your host, the man, the myth, the legend, Steve Glade. Hey, everybody. Good to see you in this new year. Woohoo! Actually, I'm not seeing you, but you're hearing us. So, Steve, uh, did you actually stay up all night to watch like the New Year's ball drop? You know, the, the first year that our small group has not gotten together uh, because of uh, what the Republic of California has done to us on this New Year's uh, zone. So it's been a it's been a, a tough zone, but we're, we're, we're bringing 2021 in together strong. That's right. Happy, happy New Year again to everybody. And thanks for joining us. So in this show. Uh, we're going to go a little bit off script from our normal four segments. So, Steve, uh, can you set up the new twist for the show today? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not too often that I'm uh, re-listening to uh, a podcast uh, discuss the business of the day or stuff like that, but um, was re-listening to one. And we have a, a special two-part program. It's featuring uh, Pastor Rick Warren uh, from a hey, Saddleback Church. You know that. And this is from almost two years ago when he spoke at our lobby. Now, we have a virtual lobby coming up next month uh, because of the COVID pandemic and everything that's uh, all going on with that. Jason, uh, who is our producer, is going to close out this show. Uh, We'll give you some more information on that. But I'm going to give you a great code called Save Cash, uh, which if you use that at checkout, you'll save 30% on it. But uh, the lobby is a, a great opportunity to for other small group point people to gather again. Again, you, you'll, you'll hear more information from Jason. But this this recording is from the lobby almost two years ago, and you know we've selected portions out of Rick's talk uh, for this program. Rick is not only my boss, but uh, he's a friend. And I get to serve along with him as an elder of Saddleback Church and to be with him and to hear his mind. Uh, He's the founder of Saddleback Church, has 19 campuses. We have just under 8,000 groups. He's the author of Purpose Driven Church. I I can go on and on and on again. But what is so spooky about this podcast is he was talking about uh, the, the future pieces and current and future trends that the church is going to be faced with. Now, this was all way before COVID. And it, it was, you know, I want to encourage you as a small group point person to re-listen to this. Uh, we're going to give you part one right here. And, uh, you know, part two is in the show notes that you can grab. But each component, I want you to think through how your small group ministry is aligned and how it can adapt to what 2021 is going to be presenting us. Now, in part one, you're going to hear uh, Rick's heart about uh, small groups and the stories and why he's such an advocate for both temple courts and house to house. You're going to hear how he is, uh, and it's going to be something great for your senior pastor to listen to because he really sets the stage for the strategy behind it. And then in part two, Rick is going to be talking about current and future trends in society and why groups are excruciatingly important to the mission of the church. Now, little did we know then that COVID would hit us. And, you know, as I'm re-listening to this and as um, as I'm talking it over more with staff, these two sessions are going to be critical for you to listen to with your staff because they're going to help you come out of, of 2020, the misery of 2020, and land strong in 2021. So buckle up and listen to part one with Pastor Rick Warren. Well, you've been around uh, Saddleback probably long enough if you read Steve's book to know that uh, at Saddleback, you say that small groups are not a ministry of the church. Small groups are not a program of the church. Small groups are not an outreach of the church. Small groups are not an event of the church. 
Small groups are the church. It is the church. It is the purest expression of the church. It is the church. The weekend is not the church. It's the crowd. A crowd is not a church. A lot of guys build a crowd and think they got a church. No, they just have a crowd. A crowd can be turned into a church. And if you want a big church, you got to have a big crowd to get there. The crowd is not a church. The weekend is just a funnel. Sometimes I'll hear people and staff say, it's all about the weekend. They're dead wrong. They're just dead wrong. If all you have is the weekend, you have an event, not a church, not a fellowship, not a koinonia, not a congregation. It is the funnel by which you're going to move them into the church. And if you have a strategy like Purpose Driven, where you bring them in, you build them up, you teach them how, and you send them out, then you can build a church. And when I started Saddleback, now um, we're, we started our 40th year in January. Saddleback is the only church in America that I know of, at least the only large one, that has more people in small groups than come on the weekend. On a typical weekend, we might have uh, 29, 30,000 people uh, show up for church at all of our campuses. Uh, but during the week, we can have as high as 40,000, and during campaigns, as high as 45,000 people in small groups. We've had as high, I don't know what it is right now, but we've had as high as 8,422 groups. Every city in Southern California has Saddleback 12 groups in it. We're in 196 cities, from Santa Monica to San Diego. Every single city in Southern California has Saddleback groups in it. That's why when we get ready to start uh, you know, a campus, like we were getting ready to start Huntington Beach campus, I said, how many groups have got in Huntington Beach? 400. 400. Now, I can teach you, and actually Steve can teach you how to do that, but we can't teach you how to do it quickly. It took 39 years. So those huge numbers I just told you, that it didn't happen overnight. It took 39 years of consistent, systematic, sequential, loving people, tr trusting people, training people, building into people, building leaders. I can teach any of you how to grow a church. I cannot teach you how to do it quickly. In fact, when you see a church that grows from like zero to 4,000 in like a couple of years, that's not normal growth. It's actually transfer growth every time. So what happens is somebody comes into town, they have to have a good communicator, and a lot of Christians go from other churches over to that place. That's not legitimate growth. God has called us to be fishers of men, not keepers of the aquarium, and transferring fish back and forth. And what, what's the new... So well, I'm not impressed when I see a church go from zero to three or four thousand. We didn't grow that way. On the fifth year of Saddleback Church, we still had 500 people. Not 5,000. And it was systematic year after year after year. Well, you got to know how to bring them in. You got to know how to build them up. You got to know how to teach them and train them for leadership. And you got to know how to send them out. Of course, as you've heard, you, you know, we use a baseball diagram just to, as a visual, getting them to first base. That's those 50,000 baptized and, and into the membership of Saddleback Church and taking class 101. Then we get them to second base and they sign the maturity covenant and we get them in a small group. And once people are in a small group, I stop worrying about them. Because I know their needs are going to be taken care of. But the bottom line is you don't need a lot of stuff to grow a church. What you do need is you need love. And you can't love a crowd. Love can only happen when you've got four people or six people or eight people or ten people. In small groups, small really is better. Small really is better. Four is better than six. Six is better than eight. Eight is better than ten. You get more than ten people in a small group, somebody stops talking. And the person with the most outgoing personality will tend to dominate the larger the group becomes, just like I'm doing right now. And, and so, really, small is better. And one of the values of, of, of Saddleback, as you said, is, as I said earlier, so, uh, small groups are not a program of the church. They are the church. It is the church. It's where koinonia takes place. It's where the church happens. It's more important than anything else. Because that's where 58 times in the New Testament the phrase one another is used. Love one another. Care for one another. 
pray for one another, encourage one another, greet one another, serve one another, share with one another, and on and on and on. It is the 58 one another's of the mutual ministry of the body of Christ that cannot take place in a crowd. So I'm preaching this constantly. you got to be in a group. You're not really a part of this church unless you're in a group. And that's how we have more people in small groups than actually come on Sunday morning. But we don't even leave at second base. We move into third base, which is we train them for their ministry. And we have about 25,000 people who've been trained in ministry. We have over 500 ministries that work out in the community during the week. I don't even know them all anymore. There's just so many things going on. But even that's not enough. Maturity is not an end in itself. Maturity is for ministry. Ministry is not an end in itself. You've got to move them around to home plate, bring them home, Grand Slam Disciple, which is mission. Send them out. Bring them in, build them up, teach them how, send them out. Bring them in, build them up, teach them how, send them out. Small groups play an integral part in all four of those things. And so the, the New Testament model for a healthy church is large group worship, a small group fellowship, temple courts, and house to house. And those two things uh, create the yin and the yang of a healthy church, large group worship, small group fellowship, temple courts, house to house. And if you get that done, you'll grow a healthy church. It's when you start adding on all this other stuff that isn't in the Bible that starts making the church uh, so busy going to meetings that they don't have time to know their neighbor and have a barbecue and win them to Christ. Most Christians don't know their neighbors. Why? One of the worst things is that the longer you're a Christian, the fewer non-believers you know. Because you spend all your time with believers. I, I don't even think like a Christian. I think like a pastor. That's two generations removed from reality. And so the most effective evangelists in your church are not your old Christians. They're, it's the brand new ones. Because they still have all the contacts. They're the ones who aren't afraid of non-believers because they were one five minutes ago. But the longer you're a Christian, the more you start fearing non-believers and feel alien to you. So the first thing you just need to accept is that what you're doing is the church. It's not an extension of the church. It's not a program of the church. It is the church. Temple courts and house to house. It's half of the New Testament model. That's why I talk about it all the time. We used to specialize our small groups. And there were some that were specializing in evangelism. And there were some that specialized in ministry. And some specialized in discipleship. We're a discipleship group. We're studying for that. And some specialized in fellowship. We're a fellowship group. And some specialized in worship. We, we just get together and worship. That's not a healthy church. That's not a healthy group. The, for a group to be healthy, it has to have all the DNA. Every church, every small group must have all five purposes in it. It must worship. Your small group must worship. It must fellowship. It must disciple. It must grow, mature. It must minister. A non-serving uh, group is a contradiction. Like a non-serving Christian is a contradiction. And it must do outreach. It must reach out. It must have a mission. So all of the DNA, all five purposes of God. You know there are five purposes of God for the church. Not six, not seven, not four, not two. There are five. I could give you a hundred books written over the last thousand years that would tell you whether you're Catholic or an Orthodox or Episcopal or Evangelical or Pentecostal, that there are five purposes of the church. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. Those five purposes are modeled in Acts 2. Those five purposes are prayed for by Jesus in John 17. Those five purposes are explained by Paul in Ephesians 4. But they are best summarized in two statements of Jesus, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. If you get the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, you'll, you'll grow a great church. That's the, that's the theme of Saddleback Church. I invite you to steal it. It's fine. A great commitment to the Great Commandment and a great commission will grow a great church. A great commitment to the great commandment and a great commission will grow a great Christian. A great commitment to a great commission and a great commandment will grow a great company. 
or a great city or a great community or a great country. These are the twin pillars of Jesus. One day Jesus walking down the street, one day a guy comes up and says, what's the most important thing? Gee, oh, that's easy. I'm going to summarize it in two sentences. I'm going to give you all the law and the prophets. I'm going to summarize the entire Bible. This is cliff notes on the Bible. Here it is. Simple. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the first two purposes of the church. Now, what is that called? To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength is called worship. Worship is simply expressing my love to God. Every time I express my love to God in any way, whether I'm by myself, in a small group, or with 500 people, I'm worshiping. Worship is expressing my love to God. It's telling God you love Him. Love your neighbors yourself, that's called ministry. And Jesus said, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, that counts. And so the first two purposes of your life and the first two purposes of your church are worship and ministry. Love God and serve others. Love them who serve us. So we get two of the purposes of the church and two of the purposes for every small group out of the great commandment. We get the other three purposes out of the great commission. There are five verbs in these two sentences. And in the great commission, he says, go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, oh, by the way, teach them to do everything I've commanded you. Go make disciples. Okay, that's evangelism. Teach them to do everything I've taught you, commanded you. That's discipleship. Now, between the twin goals of evangelism and discipleship, says, oh, by the way, baptize them into the body of Christ. Bring them in. Don't just make believers, make belongers. We're not just called to believe, we're called to belong. And this is the incorporation purpose, or fellowship. I've been serving the Lord now almost 50 years. What keeps me going? I love Jesus Christ. I love him with all my heart. And if he never did anything else for me, I will serve him. And as long as I have breath, I will offer my body as a living sacrifice, and I will do things that wear me out. Because he died for me. So the DNA of all five purposes has to be in every small group for it to be healthy. It has to have worship elements. It has to have fellowship elements. It has to have service elements. It has to have you know uh, mission elements. And of course, it has to have uh, growth or, or discipleship in, in the Word of God. So um, that, that's pretty standard stuff. But really what I came to tell you this morning, and I believe this was the, the depth of my heart, uh, I've been thinking about it for the better part of the last year, is that in the next 10 years, I've been watching the trends of our society now for years. And the world is very different today, 40 years later, after I started Saddleback. This is not 1980s. It's not 1990s. It's not even the 2000s. But society has changed drastically, radically, from when I was 20, 10, 25 years old and started this church. Now, the purposes never change because they're eternal. But how you do those purposes has to change with every generation. You don't get to choose the purposes of your church, sorry. If you don't do these five things, you're not a perfect church. You're a social club. So we don't get to say, what's going to be our purpose? It's already been determined. Jesus said, I will build my church. He decided what the purposes of the church are. But we do get to choose the style and the methodologies by which we fulfill. There are lots of ways to worship. And there are lots of ways to fellowship. And there are lots of ways to disciple believers. And there are lots of ways to serve and minister. And there are lots of ways to do evangelism and mission. We don't get to choose the purposes, but we do get to choose how, when, where. And that uh, gives us a lot of great freedom. And those have to change because the world is changing. I uh, made a list and shared it with my uh, team a year ago, our elders of what I call 10 crucial trends uh, in our society. I'm not gonna go through all of those, 
but I want to just talk to you about one of them. Uh, because uh, the antidote to every one of these trends is in the small group. So what you're doing, what you're leading, is actually going to become excruciatingly important, particularly in the next 10 years, as we change cultures. Because the word evangelical and because the word Christian has a negative connotation for a sizable portion of our society today, it's considered this and this and this and this, you name it. I don't think that the church's front door is going to be the worship service much longer. I think we're going to reach more people through the side doors than the front doors. Now, let me give you a model of this. I have, a, I have a Mormon neighbor, and if my Mormon neighbor came to me and go, Rick, you've got to come to church with me this weekend. It's incredible. The music, you're going to love it. It's incredible. We've got this band, and they are hot. And we've got lighting, and we've got smoke machines, and it, it's just really good music. And, and we got free Starbucks coffee. And, and we've, got, we've got donuts, free. They're really good. They're fresh. And we got incredible child care for your children. And, and, and parking. We got valet parking. And, and you can come up and we'll actually park your car for you. And you don't have to wear dress up. You can wear flip flops and a t shirt and shorts. And he gives me like 25 different features. And in my mind, I'm going, I don't care. I just want to be a Mormon. There is no feature that your church can offer that's going to make me want to be a Mormon. Because in my mind, a Mormon is this. You know what I'm talking about? So there's no feature you can ask. Well, we've got the special celebrity guest coming. I don't care. I don't want to be a Mormon. There's nothing you could say that's going to make me want to be a Mormon. A lot of people are like that with Christianity now. Because the word has taken on a negative term, and it's been politicized, and it's been <clears throat> all kinds of problems with it. What breaks my heart is that the bride of Christ has mud on her face, and her beautiful white dress has been sullied, and her hair has been messed up. I want to see the beauty of the bride of Christ restored in our nation. We will either have revival or America will go the way of Europe, which it lost its soul. And in a vacuum, nature abhors a vacuum, Islam has moved into that vacuum in, in Europe. We will either have a fourth great awakening, which I pray for, or we will continue in our decline and we will have different kinds of ministry. I went back and reread Augustine's City of God. City of God was written in about 400 something AD when, in the fall of Rome. By that time, Rome was looked not as the enemy of Christianity, but as the supporter of Christianity. It was the official religion. And when Rome fell, the Christians goes, what's gonna happen to our faith? The city of God, Rome, has fallen. What's going to happen? And, and Augustine writes this, the culture's going to the pagans. By this time, Rome, Christianity was the primary thing in Rome, and all these great cathedrals and stuff. But the one thing I can say about Christianity, is, I, and the one thing I can say about the future, is I don't know what life's going to be in 100, 200, 500 but if a thousand years from today, Jesus Christ still hasn't come back, I don't know where to be ready at any moment, but if he hasn't come back in a thousand years, well, I can't tell you this, there won't be a Microsoft in a thousand years. There won't be an Apple. There won't be a Starbucks. Shoot, there won't be a United States of America. Why? Because no human thing lasts forever. No empire lasts. Where's the, where's the, Roman, where's the Roman Empire? It's gone. Where's the Hittite Empire? Where's the Ugaritic Empire? Where's the Assyrian Empire? Where's the Sumerian Empire? 
Where's the Hittite Empire? They're all gone. Everything. One thing you can say about any dictator or president, they won't be here for long. It's just a window. And the church has outlasted every dictator, has outlasted every core leader, has outlasted every attack, war, cult, criticism, persecution. Persecution is actually good for the church. Wherever the church is persecuted, it grows. But I'm saying that the idea of building a, quote, an attractive church where the front door is, we offer all these cool things, isn't going to cut it in the next generation. So how do you do the purposes in a new way that attract a new generation? Acts 13, 36, David served God's purpose in his generation, then he died. That's my life verse. I want to serve God's purpose in my generation. When I die, who wants to stay around here anyway? Well, it's God's food with you. you. You do the timeless in a timely way. You do that which never changes in a world that's constantly changing. You do that, do that which is eternal in a contemporary and relevant way. You serve God's purpose in your generation. And by the way, you can't serve God's generation in anybody else's generation. There are some people who think the golden age of Christianity is the Reformation. They'd like to go back to that. There's some people who think the golden age is the 1950s. They'd like to go back to that. You can't go back to any, you can only serve God's purpose in your generation right now. And here's what we've got. We've got a generation that is increasingly not interested in coming to church. What is going to attract? How do we win people in a thing where it's not low hanging fruit? throw open your doors and say you all come and have something nice and offer them a nice seat and comfortable parking. How are you going to reach people like that? Okay, I want you to listen closely. I've studied this my entire life. People come to Christ when they're in transition or under tension. You might write that down. People come to Christ when they're in transition or under tension. They come to Christ when they're in pain. God speaks to us, whispers to us in our, you know, in our pleasure, C.S. Lewis said, and shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone. And so I highly recommend that you start, stop trying to reach everybody in your community. And just start focusing on the people who are in pain. Leave the happy pagans alone because they will get in pain eventually. But don't worry about, you know, Jesus said in the sower of the sower of the fields, he said there are four kinds of soil. And when you sow the seed, there's, you know, the hard ground that it doesn't even come up, and then there's the rocky ground and it comes up a little bit and dies, and there's a rock ground with weeds, and then there's the good soil, of the four kinds of soil, the good soil, and that plants and it multiplies 50, 25, 100 fold, and you have great fruit. Now, if that's true, and of course Jesus never said anything that wasn't true, if there are four kinds of soil, and those represent four kinds of heart, the hard heart, the conflicted heart, the, you know, the hard-hearted, uh, the, the busy heart, and the open heart, if that's true, Jesus is saying only 25% of the people out there are open. That 75% of the soil is not going to receive the, the seed. Does that make sense? 75% of society out there is not going to be interested in the good news of Jesus Christ. But there's 25% out there that man, when it gets that seed, it, it catches it and it grows. I'm begging you to start focusing on the 25%. And that's the people in pain. It is not my job to prepare the soil. It's my job to plant the seed where it will grow the best. It is God's job to prepare the soil. God is in the hard cultivation business, not me. How does God turn hard soil into good soil? How does he turn dead bedrock, you can't see, seed just lays on top, into something that will receive the seed? How does God turn hard into soft? Hard. He sends a storm. He sends rain. And when the rain comes down long enough on that hard 
hard soil, it gets soft and it gets softer and it gets softer and eventually the seed can be in. I think more people are going to be brought to Christ through the relationships in small groups than any front door evangelism in the next 15 to 20 years. You're hearing it from me. You're hearing it from me. This makes what you do more important than the weekend. As I said, people are always attracted to love. And where do you show love? You can't show love in a crowd. Oh, turn to the person next to you and say, I love you. That's weird. <laughs> and, and, and so only in authentic community can you have authentic love. And, and that's why the value of small groups is so, so important. Okay, now part one set the stage. Now, once you go to your show notes and click part two and see what Rick has to say that's so relevant for today and all that we've gone through in COVID. And I want you to be able to ask yourself a couple of questions. One is, in my small group ministry, what are the things that I'm hearing from both part one and part two that I need to, you know, dial in and sharpen in my small group ministry? And maybe because a lot of things have changed prior to COVID and you're starting to come into a new season, what things do I not want to start up? And then maybe what new things do I need to start up? So as you're listening to, uh, you're going into the show notes and listening to part two, run those questions uh, through your, your, your mind as you're listening to it and you're taking notes. And also I want you to stay on, listen to Jason, because he's going to tell you a little bit more about our virtual lobby and how you can use save cash to save 30%. Hey, Small Group Network family, Jason Banzoff here, Group Talk producer and Small Group Network Creative Arts Director. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Inside Saddleback, and thank you so much to Steve Gladen and Pastor Rick Warren for kicking our new year off well. Now, before we go, let's talk about something we already talked about earlier, Virtual Lobby 2021. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions in California, this year's annual lobby gathering will be held live online. And the lobby is one of the nation's premier small group training and networking events. This year's event will run from 9 a.m. to noon Pacific Standard Time each day, and will start off with a general session in the first hour, followed by various breakout sessions on every small group hot topic you can think of. Speakers include Steve Gladen from Saddleback, Bill Willis from North Point, Jared Kirkwood from Mariners, and Dave Enns from North Coast, and over 40 breakout session speakers. Get 30% off now by using code SAVECASH. That's S-A-V-E-C-A-S-H. Visit smallgroupnetwork.com forward slash events to register you and your team today. And thank you for listening to Group Talk. We invite you to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes and get new episodes downloaded automatically. Also, if you enjoy this program, please take a few minutes to give us a positive rating on iTunes so that other small group point people can find us more easily. We encourage you to visit our website, smallgroupnetwork.com, to access our library of free resources, connect to a huddle with other small group ministry leaders in your area, read our blog articles, or join us on our Facebook group. Don't forget to use the hashtag SGNet when engaging with your social media channels. Thank you for your support.